intro. I know. <laughs> Welcome to my very first makeup and true crime video. This has been something that's been on my mind to do for a very long time. Yeah, I was looking for a, a sign and literally a true crime case fell in my lap. Not this one, but another one that I'll be sharing with you guys within the next... Is that a bird? <laughs> anyway, uh, that video I will be sharing with you guys within the next six videos, I want to say. But that one is crazy and it came directly from the sole survivor of that case that's wild it's wild and it, it, it kind of brought a tear to me when i heard it from him but anyway i was very nervous to record this video for several reasons today's video we will be paying homage to how i got involved in true crime so i have like a little backstory i'll be sharing with you guys that kind of leads up to the case you guys when i tell you this video has been one of the most challenging videos i have ever created as a content creator whoo the makeup and true crime girlies definitely deserve their flowers because they make it look so easy but it is in fact not okay <laughs> and if i wasn't so passionate about true crime i think i would have hung it up after this video for real but don't worry we're not gonna throw in the towel we're gonna stick it through and there's also another true crime story. It's a shorter one, which I will be telling before my backstory. So it actually segues into my backstory. And then the backstory segues into the meat and potatoes of today's video, which is the main case. And the main case is also where the tutorial begins. One last thing, because I know you want to get to the stories. There is a loud clanking noise at some point. It's not too long, but it was my mom doing laundry and I completely tuned it out, not realizing that, hey... The camera cannot do the same thing your brain is doing right now. And I didn't realize that until I was reviewing the footage. So I try to put some music on during that part to help minimize the distractions. So forgive me. <laughs> but by the time the main case rolls around, all of that will not be there. Okay, I'm done. So yeah, and let me know in the comment section how you guys got into true crime. Like, you know I killed or nothing, right? I ain't no killer, don't push me. And then I'll be doing my makeup, and this is the look that I created, so hopefully you like it. And of course, all the products that I used in today's video will be linked down below. So anyway, if true crime is your cup of tea, you like to watch this type of content, then make sure you subscribe because you will not be disappointed. A young African-American woman in her mid-20s is getting up to get ready to start her day. Her husband is asleep in the bedroom because he just came home from his overnight shift and she's getting ready quietly as to not wake him up so he can get some rest. Meanwhile, their three-year-old daughter is in her bed sleeping as well. So after she gets up and gets herself ready without interruption from the three-year-old, she then proceeds to wake her child up so that she could go ahead and get her ready as well and they can get their day started. Now this woman, she went to school during the day and then she also worked at Burger King until like 7, 8 o'clock and then she would come home and basically her and her husband would swap with watching their daughter. Because money was tight, sometimes they would not be able to afford a babysitter. So this day was no different. So she got up, she got ready, got dressed. It's cold outside, so she had to make sure she had her jacket as well as the jacket for her daughter ready to go. So after they're both dressed, ready to go, they start heading out the door. Now, normally she would let her daughter walk hand in hand with her, but then once they got outside, she would always pick her up and walk her to the car. Now again, this is taking place in Newark, New Jersey, which back in the 80s was not really a safe place and I'm assuming it's still not a safe place now. So again, she's walking out of the building after coming down a couple flights of stairs and she picks up her daughter and she's carrying her in her arms. So as she's walking to her car to put her daughter in her vehicle, a man abruptly approaches her and attempts to snatch her daughter out of her arms so this woman is literally 
playing tug of war with her daughter and this crazy strange man. She is holding on to her daughter and screaming for dear life, praying that she does not lose grip of her child because she knew that if she was to lose grip of her daughter, she would never see her again. But for whatever reason, her husband comes outside, not knowing what's going on. So he comes outside and he sees what's going on and as he starts yelling, running towards the situation, the man who is attempting to steal their daughter lets go and takes off. Now everyone is hysterical. He's trying to find out who the hell this guy was and what the heck is going on. And so she's all hysterical explaining to him. He came out of nowhere and they're just very thankful that the situation did not escalate. That little girl in that story was me. I was terrified. And the fact that I remember it being that it was such a long time ago is crazy because I literally remember all of it. I remember how our apartment looked. I remember walking down this hallway and it was an old, very big brick building. I remember everything. I remember screaming my lungs out because I was literally getting tugged both ways. And it was the scariest day of my life. So I wanted to share that story with you because Today's case talks about child abduction and it's very real. Like that happened to me almost, you know? And had she not held on for their life, no telling where I would be today. That could that probably could have been a crackhead who was looking for his next fix and I looked like a come up to him. I don't know. I could have been sex trafficked, you never know. He could have been a pedophile. There are so many things that he could have been up to and I'm just thankful that I didn't have to fast forward a few years later I'm now eight years old my sister is four and some of our favorite pastimes included going to Borders and Best Buy and in Borders is basically like a Barnes and Nobles right so you would go in there they have tons of books and myself and my sister we would love going in there to read all types of books and they also had like a music section you could they had like a station with headsets and you put the headsets on and you got to listen to like a sample of the album like every song and then if you like the album you could go ahead and buy it because it would be right there in front of you to pick up on top of other music that the artist released i mean it's not like today where you have apple music at the touch of a button okay things were different back then <laughs> sometimes our dad would just let us like roam through their and we would just have a good old time. Now I say my dad because sometimes my mom had to work on Saturdays, so most times we were with him, but the times where she was free, we would do stuff like Liberty Park or whatnot. And we would do that and he would let us roam around the store and he would always sit in the front of the store near the exit or one of the exits. And we always used to wonder why he did that, like why he just wouldn't sit near where we were at the time. But later in life, I learned why he was doing that. And then our other favorite last time was Best Buy. And in Best Buy, they had the video game consoles hooked up to like a big screen TV. M me and my sister, we loved going to that station. Like literally every time we walked in Best Buy, shoom, straight to the video games, nowhere else. Our dad, he would let us go over there and sometimes he would be like, I'm going over to Borders, make sure you guys stay here. And I would be in charge when he was not around. So, you know, I was like, you're not taking my sister, you know what I'm saying? Because you don't have to take me too. I had a lot of responsibility as a kid. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So sometimes he would leave us in the store and he would head over to the other store and then, you know, come check back on us in like half an hour and make sure we were good. And we would always be good. No matter what we were doing though, we always had to be back home in time to catch two shows, okay? every Saturday, like clockwork. The first one was Cops, which came on at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturdays. And the second one was America's Most Wanted, and that came on at 9 p.m. and both shows ran for one hour. Listen, that was the highlight of the weekend. If we missed those shows, it was a bad weekend, okay? So Cops would be like what First 48 is now for a lot of you guys who are the Gen Zs. And they always had that infamous intro, which a lot of you may know from the Bad Boys series. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? Oh, what you gonna do when they come for you? Nobody now fucking know what Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you 
gonna do when they come for you? Nobody now give you no break. Police now give you no break. <laughs> but the bread and butter for me and my sister was hands down America's Most Wanted. Hands down, okay? Now, mind you, I'm eight. My sister is four. Yeah. My mother was not going for it, okay? She did not. I repeat, did not approve of us watching this show. But my dad was like, ah, let the kids watch it. Let the kids watch it. You know, they need to be aware. They need to know what's going on. That's what's wrong with this world now. They're not informing the children of what's going on in the world. Da, 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 da. So it was always this constant bickering every Saturday. But listen, me and my sister were like, because to us, you know, although our dad is telling us that these are real people and these are real cases, to us it was like a movie. It was literally like a horror movie and I liked horror movies, okay? I liked scary movies, I liked all of that. So to me, America's Most Wanted was like mini horror episodes compacted into one hour. Was it a man or was it Lisa Castellone? Stand by, our nationwide manhunt is underway. Your call to 1-800-CRIME-88 could give police the clues they need to capture America's most wanted. Now, although the light bulb wasn't that bright, it was flickering, okay? We had a little dim light action because one thing I always noticed that the show emphasized on were missing person cases, particularly child abductions. Now, of course, eight-year-old me had no idea how this show originated. I didn't know the background. I don't know if my dad knew, but I didn't, and neither did my sister. But it was always something I noticed that they put a lot of emphasis on. I never really understood that until my motor skills started kicking in when I got a little older. And he will always remind us, like, hey, these are real people. These are real cases. And you need to be aware because you don't want something to happen to you. And that circles back to why he was comfortable with letting us play those video games unattended. Because you always kind of went through a routine like, what would you do in this scenario? And this is what you do if this happens. You watch where they're taking her and vice versa, you know? Because you never know who a pedophile is looking for. They might be looking for something young, 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 or something in the middle that would be me. So you just never know. And so he wanted to make sure we were prepared for all cases. That story with the Best Buy specifically ties into this true crime case and you will see why. So now let's go ahead and start the John and Adam Walsh case. John Edward Walsh Jr. was born on December 25th, 1945. So he was a Christmas baby to parents John Edward Walsh Sr. And Jean Walsh. After graduating high school, John enrolled into the University of Buffalo. In 1965, John met his future boo, Reve, during school, and six years later, they would end up getting married. In 1974, on November 14th, they had their first son named Adam. So they eventually relocated to South Florida after both John and Reve graduated college and there is where John had gotten his first job as a builder for luxury resorts. So fast forward to July 27th, 1981. Reve would be running a ton of errands with her son Adam who is now six years old. Now she had a ton of things to do and she wanted to have them done fast and in a hurry. But having a six-year-old with her would obviously be a challenge, but that was just something she had to deal with because, you know, you're a mom now. This is your life. One of the first things that Reve had to get done was stop by Adam's school to drop off the tuition check so that he could attend school for the following year. And then after that, she had to go to Sears because she had a few things to pick up from the lamp department. So the Sears stores that Reve had to go to was located in the Hollywood Mall. And this obviously was not her first time there. So she knew when she went to this mall that she was going to have an issue with Adam because there was a section that they had to go past in order to get to the lamp department. And that was the toy section followed by the game system. So when they got to Sears, she basically had to 
grasp Adam's hand and drag him past the toy section. But in the midst of doing that, the video game section or entertainment area caught the attention of Adam and he basically begged and pleaded for his mom to let him go play the video games. And like I told you guys earlier, in my personal story, this was something that a lot of department stores did back in the day to lure the kids in to want to play the video game and eventually become so attached that they begged their parents for the game. But it was all part of a ploy to get these parents to spend that, that coin, that money, because that's all they were after. And so it was normal for parents to leave their kids there because a lot of times it would be like a free arcade in the department store. So this particular time was no different. Now, because Adam was begging and pleading and she really needed to get her day going and she knew she needed to get to that lamp department, she essentially contemplated at first, but when she saw that there were some other boys congregating around the game area, she felt a little bit better about leaving Adam over there. In my opinion, that's how I'm thinking her brain is processing the situation. And that's why she left him in the, in the vicinity of the TV with the game. Now, before going over to the lamp department, she bent down, looked at Adam, and pointed to where she was going and said, look, I'm going right over there, which was only like a couple feet away. And she said, I will be right back. Do not wander off, stay right here. She's telling Adam this, and he's like, okay, 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 yeah, yeah, I promise. And you know how kids are, in one ear and out the other. But in this case, I don't think he really would have wanted to leave because he was dead set on playing this game. So she said, okay, and then also promised him that they would go for ice cream after she returned from the lamp department. Because, I mean, who wants to go in the lamp department at six years old? You know, like... There's nothing exciting about lamps. Reve ends up handling her business in the lamp department and now she's ready to go get Adam so they can go ahead and continue on with the rest of the day. So when she returns back to the gaming area, she discovers that he is not there. So she lets out a sigh and starts panicking for a moment. And at first, she's just thinking, okay, he's got to be around here somewhere, so let me just let me just calm down. So she starts looking around. She's asking people if they've seen Adam, and no one has seen him. And then she comes across this young boy who looks approximately around his age and had on a similar hat to the one that Adam was wearing. So she approaches the child and asks him, hey... Have you seen a boy that was wearing a hat similar to the one you have on? And she waited for a response, but he never verbally said anything. At this point, she's thinking like, okay, maybe he didn't understand what I was asking him because all he did was look at her and then point to the west exit of the store. And so she's just thinking like, okay, he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about because me and Adam didn't come through there. So she continues looking and searching and scouring the store for Adam. And basically the employees were just very dismissive and they're not really doing much to help the situation. So as she's panicking, looking around for her son, her eyes land on a familiar face. And once she sees this familiar face and she lets out a sigh of relief, Grams, which is Adam's grandma, and that's what Adam referred to her whenever she was in his presence. So at this point, she sees Grams, and immediately she lets out a sigh of relief because now she knows where Adam took off to. Reve approaches Grams and says, Oh my goodness, I was panicking because I couldn't find Adam. Where is he? And Grams is looking at Reve puzzled because she's looking at her like, He's not with me. And so immediately, Reve starts to go into panic mode again because she just knew that Adam was going to be with his grandmother. So once they realize that Adam is actually missing, they're now trying to get the attention of the employees as well as the security guards. John is also notified that Adam is missing, like they cannot find him. So as soon as he heard about what was going on, 
he speeds over to the mall, like literally going way over the speed limit to say the least, to catch up with Reve and see what, what seems to be the problem. How can we find him? And why isn't anyone helping you? Et cetera, et cetera. So John reaches the mall and he catches up with Reve to get, you know, the scoop on what's going on. So she's telling him how frustrated she is because she's trying to get help, but no one is really taking her seriously and everyone is just super nonchalant about the situation and telling her like, oh, he's around here somewhere. You know, we'll find him, blah, blah, blah. So John wrote a book called Tears of Rage. And in the book, there's an excerpt where he states that he felt like the employees and the security guards basically dismissed Reve because of her appearance. You know, it was summertime. She had shorts on. She looked pretty young and she didn't really look like what a mother would look like. But then again, what is a mom supposed to look like, right? Moms come in variations of looks, styles, colors, shapes, heights, weights. That doesn't matter. The point is, she had a child in her custody that is no longer in her custody and no one is doing anything to help her. At this point, when they see John, now, only when John arrives do they start taking things seriously and they notify the authorities of what's going on. Security guards notify the authorities of what's happening in the Hollywood Mall and the authorities reassure Reve and John he's probably lost or he probably ran away and if you start heading home you'll probably see him walking along the side of the road somewhere and everything will be fine. You have three different channels but each one failing them in the same manner every time. Do you know how frustrating that is to not be able to find your child to be in such a panic state and when you're trying to reach out for help, no one is helping you blatantly in front of your face? That has got to be one of the most frustrating situations to be in. And then the point of the matter is you can't like explode because these are the people you need in order to, to help you to figure out what happened here. Uh, regardless of what the authorities were telling them and the security guards were telling Reve and John, they knew that it just wasn't true. But nonetheless, they still decided to leave a note on Reve's card on the dashboard in the slim chance that what they were propositioning ended up to be true. And the note was telling Adam that mommy and daddy would be back. So later that night, a ton of neighbors were showing support for Adam and Reve, and then the following day, Reve went on her bike, riding up and down the streets, calling out Adam's name in the hopes that she would be able to find him. She even went back to the mall in hopes that he had somehow just, you know, really been lost and turned back up there, but unfortunately, all of her efforts would go unrewarded. There were a bunch of, like, sightings reported, in the Miami and the West Palm Beach area. And one police dispatcher told John that they had almost 50 million phone calls regarding sightings of Adam, but unfortunately none of them would pan out. So the Miami News ran an article on the missing six-year-old and an officer was quoted saying that the kidnapping is not suspected and that the kid was probably just somewhere. Could you imagine a police officer coming on television and dismissing your case as just a lost kid? Do you know how disrespectful that is? Tell me you don't want to be a detective without telling me you don't want to be a detective. So during the time that Adam was missing, John had a hard time sleeping. He would literally be drained and then when he would lay his head on his pillow he'd be wide awake because he obviously cannot go to sleep knowing that his son is out there somewhere missing. In addition to that, Reve was also jumping up in the middle of the night from a nightmare and in the nightmare she would say that there would be a truck that had Adam and she would be getting closer and closer to the truck and right before she's able to reach and grab her son the truck would speed off into the night and then she would wake up. And to make matters worse, now Reve and John are starting to receive phone calls from psychics 
claiming that they know where Adam is and what happened to Adam and this is infuriating the both of them because they know they're trying to get their 10 seconds of fame through Adam's case why would you reach out to a grieving family about something so horrific just to get your name out there some people really just have no morals but unlike these psychics, there are some good people in the world and one of them was John Rivet's neighbor who was a veterinarian and he stopped by their house one day with a small little puppy as a token of hope for the safe return of Adam and let John know here's a gift for him whenever he comes back home, which I thought was really sweet. So volunteers had distributed millions of flyers all around the Miami area where Adam disappeared. And on August 3rd, 1981, the reward for more information on the disappearance of Adam had increased to $100,000. Like, the Walsh family was not playing around. It has been my decision, totally on my own, that I would offer a substantial reward for information uh, resulting in the safe uh, depositing of Adam or return of Adam and that I would negotiate with the abductors in whatever way they want me to, whatever terms, if they want to leave Adam and still negotiate with me or negotiate with me and then leave. I, I don't know the formula. It's my decision. You're not going to give up hope. I, I can't give up hope. So as you guys can see, there's a clear sign of desperation, not only in his voice, but all over his face as well. And mainly because it's still very early on in the case, and there haven't been any additional tips or information that have gotten them any closer to a resolution. So he's taking matters into his own hands and offering a reward separately from the already existing reward with the hopes that it is monetarily motivated and once they hear about his offer, they'll contact him with instructions on how to get his son safely back home. But I'm saying all of this because I'm getting ready to ask you guys a question and if you hear it right after watching this, it may sound funny, like, what? <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify that real fast. Now, I'm not really sure how rewards work, so I don't know if that money is offered to the family or a combination of the family and the city or how that works. But if you guys know, feel free to enlighten me and maybe a few others down in the comment section. But in any event... Adam's case got so big that it was deemed to be the most extensive pursuit of a missing child in the history of the state of Florida. One afternoon, one of the detectives that was working the case of Adam Walsh contacts John and asks him to come in because they need to talk to him as well as show him something. Once John arrives at the precinct, they sit him down in a private room and they place this large binder in front of John. He's looking confused and he's like, you know, what is this a binder for? Like, who are these people? And so the detectives would tell him that, hey, this is another possibility. These are um, sex offenders. And so John is just looking at them crazy, like, well, what's a sex offender? He's never heard of this. Now, mind you, remember, this is like the 80s, the 80s and the 90s. Like, this wasn't this wasn't anything that was like highly profiled at the time so they go on to tell him you know what they are such as pedophiles etc and as John is listening to this he is literally baffled and disgusted and he's just like trying to process this information and understand how can people like this exist in the world but in any event John is trying to figure out more importantly why are they telling him about these sick individuals and what does this have to do with Adam's case? This is where they tell him that they believe one of these individuals may actually have Adam. And John is literally sick to his stomach when he hears that there's a possibility that Adam could be in the hands of one of these creeps. John, he was under the impression that if you got locked up for something like this, that you were going away for life or a very long time. But unfortunately, detectives would later on enlighten him on the fact that most times people like this would get away with it and just get a slap on the wrist, which is just sickening. 
once they have delivered what they believe to be the new direction of this case john is literally like in panic mode so he's just thinking like he hopes that some deranged woman who might be experiencing PTSD took his son and is just taking excellent care of him, maybe even taking him to his favorite place to be, which is Disney, on his favorite ride, which is Pirates of the Caribbean. Anything other than what the officers are telling him to his face. But unfortunately, that is a far-fetched dream. So four days after the disappearance of Adam, police would interview a teenage girl who was in Sears that day back in July and she would report that she remembers seeing these boys by the video game getting into an argument and the security guards ended up kicking them out and she believes that Adam may have been a part of the boys that got escorted out of Sears. So at the time, she remembers the security guards escorted two boys through the north exit and then the other two boys were escorted to the west exit. So she believed that he may have been mixed up in one of those groups. So that may have been a helpful tip, but unfortunately it did not really lead to much of anything else. So as the detectives are starting to run out of leads, they start to change the direction of the case yet again and start looking at his parents. And of course, as a original true crimer, we all know that the parents have to be exonerated as well because there are too many cases where people pretend that there is some outside source responsible for the demise of their child when in fact they were the devious individuals who did it themselves. You just never know. On August 7th, 1981, John went in for questioning with the detectives and they were actually very surprised with how forthcoming he was with information. He would even provide information that they didn't even ask for because in his mind, anything that he felt could help bring his little boy back home, he was willing to tell them. He didn't care how embarrassing it was, how bad or awful it made him look. If it helped with bringing Adam back home, he was willing to divulge the information. So after they had ruled John out as a suspect, they started to change their line of questioning and started to zero in on someone by the name of James Campbell. So once that name was brought up, John is looking at the detectives with the most puzzled look on his face like what would James have to do with the disappearance of Adam and they would start to inquire about the relationship between James and his wife Rivet. They would suspect that James was somehow jealous of the relationship that Rivet had with John and John was literally dumbfounded with the line of questioning and just assumed that the detectives were jumping to conclusions because they honestly did not have any other leads and so they were just making things up as they were going. So John of course is batting for his friend telling them James would never do anything like this why would you suspect James of something so horrific and so then that's when they started to ask him some more questions such as why are Reve and James so close? And John would tell them that Reve and James became really close once Reve got pregnant. She was very lonely because at the time, John's workload became very heavy and so he was not home a lot. But luckily for Reve, John had great friends like James around who were able to fill in for John when he could not. Now, I'm not really sure where Reve and John were residing when this friendship with Reve and James started formulating, but once they had moved to Miami, basically Reve would stop asking John to do the things that she needed him to do and just started reaching out to James all the time. And James would drive hours to come to Reve's rescue every single time. So you guys, I tried to find a picture of James Campbell, but y'all have to remember this story came out in the 80s and the internet was barely born at that time, let alone what it is now. 
So finding an accurate photo of him was a little challenging and I didn't want to run the risk of posting the wrong details. So I just left it alone. But y'all, I don't know what possessed me to research his story a little bit more because I just felt like it was surface level stuff everywhere that I was looking. And so that was all I was able to share at the time that I made this video. But I went back again and y'all, I came across some tea, honey. Boy, listen here. So not only is James the best friend or good friend of John Walsh and also the godfather to Adam, but he was also living with the Walshes. I don't know from what period to what period, but it was for two years. And when you live with people, you learn who they truly are. And you're going to find out in a little bit. And of course, John would never assume that anything was going on with his wife and his lifelong friend James. John understood that he did work and traveled a lot, which would make sense why his best friend or one of his best friends would step in and help him out where he was lacking. So eventually someone laid it all out for John and confirmed that his wife was in fact having an affair with his friend James, but at the time, John just couldn't deal with that and he honestly didn't want to give it any life. All he was focused on was finding Adam. And regardless of what they told him, he still did not believe that James was capable of kidnapping or doing anything to Adam. So as quickly as they divulged that information was as quickly as John kept debunking it. However, even though John would considerably tell them numerous times that James is not responsible, the detectives still wanted to put him as the main suspect and at that point that's where John really started to become frustrated with detectives because now he truly realizes they have no other source of direction for this case and now they're just pulling stuff out there you know what I think now is a good time to pop back in because like I told you guys that is not the end of James Campbell's story okay so not only is he the bestie of John Walsh, a quote-unquote good friend to Reve, aka her secret lover, and the godson of Adam, but he also knew another little secret that the Walshes wanted to keep swept under the rug. So the Walshes actually filed a lawsuit against Sears for the disappearance of Adam, basically because he was abducted in their dwelling. I really don't know how they were going to pull that one off. But anyway, I guess Sears must have somehow gotten James Campbell on board to be a witness for them. And the things that James knew about the Walshes would have destroyed their public identity. Okay, so basically the Walshes, they dibbled and dabbled in uh, some recreational substances. We'll call it um, propane and seed okay propane and seed you can kind of read between the lines there <laughs> and remember this is the 80s all right this is not 2022 where it's legal in some states to just walk into a dispensary and buy the ganja okay this is the 80s where someone finds out you even smoke cigarettes they're looking at you like you have three heads so imagine this information coming out to the public amidst having a missing child Oh my goodness, the public would have eaten them alive. So, because James knew all this tea on them, they decided to go ahead and just drop the whole lawsuit against Sears. Now, you know that had to be true in order for them to make that kind of move, right? But what else is sending me is the fact that John goes on to, well, you'll hear later, and then I'll chime back in on that some more. But of course, he can't really go off on these people because he needs to be as involved in his son's case as possible. And, you know, talking to them slick and out the side of his neck will only land him outside of the case and in the dark. So two young girls and their grandmother told detectives that when Adam went missing, they had seen him get pulled into a blue van. And another 12-year-old boy would basically corroborate the story that the grandmother and the young girls told the police as well. Once they realized this was a true abduction, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement issued a bolo for the blue van and searched hundreds of them over the next couple of days all over Florida. Nothing was discovered though and detectives deemed the blue van a false lead. 
Now, honestly, I don't think that it was a false lead. I just think that the person that did this was very smart. So obviously, they're not gonna they're not gonna use their own van. So more than likely, it was stolen. So in August, John and Reve were due to be on a segment of Good Morning America with the hopes of bringing national attention to Adam's case. So once they arrived in New York City, they were supposed to be meeting up with Julie Patz, which is the mother of Eaton Patz. And Eaton Patz was a boy who had disappeared on May 25th, 1979. And basically what Julie had told John was that it's very rare to see fathers in this light and that it was very commendable and hopefully that it would actually bring change and a different perspective for the parents that struggle when dealing with missing persons cases such as children. He could really truly make a difference with his involvement. So on the morning of them having to go live on Good Morning America, the phone rings around 5 a.m. Now John was already awake because he couldn't sleep for obvious reasons but also because he was afraid to miss their wake-up call to get ready to go down and film. So when he answers the phone call he doesn't know who it is but all he remembers is that the person on the phone was very delicate with the next sentence that they were about to tell John. So the person on the phone proceeds to tell John that there was a discovery and a severed head was found in a drainage canal and they needed Adam's dental records to rule him out as the possible victim. Now the person on the phone continued to say that they did not believe that it was Adam because there was another boy missing who was a little bit older than Adam and they believed it to be his decapitated head but nonetheless, they still wanted to go ahead and rule Adam out as a possibility. Whether it was his son or not, it's the fact that there was a decapitated boy discovered, you know? And it was just the head. There was no body parts or anything. It was just the head that was discovered in this drainage canal. So at this point, Good Morning America is telling them like, hey, you know, if you need to go, you can go ahead and go. We can cancel the segment. But John, despite hearing this horrible discovery, he proceeds to go on the show because at this point he's not 100% sure that it's Adam. So he doesn't want to go under false pretenses. And on top of that, he made promises to a ton of families that he would get their information out on national television as well. So he basically put his personal problem to the side for the greater good, which is very commendable. After Reve and John do their segment, they rush back to the room and wait for the call to, you know, to see if in fact it was Adam or not. So they sit and wait for this phone call that would eventually come through. And at the time the phone was ringing, John remembers being extremely nervous because this would literally be the call that determines whether Adam is alive or if he is in fact dead. So he answers the phone call and the person on the phone breaks the news that the decapitated head was confirmed to be the head of Adam Walsh. Upon hearing these details, John would let out a blood curdling scream and I could only imagine the thoughts and feelings that he was going through at the time that he heard the news and it was so crazy that the security guards had to run into the room because they weren't sure what was going on in there that's how devastatingly eerie his cry out was so after he got himself together he he immediately asked for them to summon his wife to the room so Reve was down in the hotel bar and once they came to meet her at the bar she immediately knew that her son was not coming back to her. Two fishermen made the grim discovery last night. They found the head of a young child under this bridge where they were fishing. The location is just along the Florida Turnpike at the 130 mile marker, one mile north of the Indian River St. Lucie County line, just west of Vero Beach. 
Highway patrolmen, Vero Beach rescue workers, and Indian River Sheriff's deputies searched the canal through the night. Around 3 o'clock this morning, the remains were brought here to the medical examiner's office at Indian River Memorial Hospital, where the autopsy was performed. Later, a family representative brought Adam Walsh's dental records here. A sheriff's department spokesman confirmed the findings of Indian River medical examiner and, uh, Franklin Cox. They identified it by dental records, which were brought up here by the Hollywood uh, Police Department. The remains were not so badly decomposed as a visual identification was not impossible by somebody who was familiar and knew the boy. Over 1,000 people ended up coming to the funeral for Adam Walsh. And unfortunately for the Walsh family, because Adam's head was considered evidence, they did not return it to the family. So they didn't have anything to necessarily bury. So at the funeral, they had a white casket representing what would have been Adam's body and placed a picture on top of it. So after the confirmation of Adam's death, there was a series that was created about the life of Adam Walsh and it was like a movie basically that aired once a year for three years in a row. So it was aired on 1983, 1984, and 1985. And so after it aired every year at the end of the show or film rather, there were a series of photos of other missing children that were presented as well as a hotline number that people could reach out to if they had any information regarding any of the cases in which they were watching on TV. So it was later reported that 13 of the 55 children shown after the Adam film aired were found. So that's actually really amazing that even with something so horrific happening that there was still some good out of the situation even though it wasn't for the Walsh family directly they were able to help other families as well. In 1984 Congress passed the Missing Children's Assistance Act which was supported by John and Reve. The National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. This organization focuses on providing information for missing children and John Walsh is on the board of directors with the organization. So in 1988 John went on to launch America's Most Wanted after securing a deal with Fox and as I told you guys earlier the main focus or reason behind that was because of the death of his son. Now when the show aired people already knew who John was because of the high profile case and also his support with the missing children organizations as well. Now, during the run of America's Most Wanted, it was responsible for apprehending thousands of criminals. And not just criminals involved with child abductions, but other cases as well. Cold cases, murders, just all types of crimes. Hey, I'm back. So you remember that good old friend, James Campbell, that I mentioned to you guys a little bit ago? You know, the one who had knowledge of the drug abuse problem that Rose and John Walsh were so desperately trying to hide, right? Well, the point I was trying to make was that John Walsh went on to host America's Most Wanted. Now, of course, I didn't want to say that prior to the storyline mentioning that detail. But hear me out, hear me out. He goes on to host the show, right? I find it very ironic that he goes on to host the show Meanwhile, he's no different than the people that they're going after. So you've got him and his wife participating in a illegal activity. And textbook definition, illegal, is participating in something that is forbidden by law, which means that would be considered criminal activity. But the only difference between him and them is because he wasn't convicted, so technically he wouldn't be a criminal. But he showed signs of being one. And then, of course, the other noticeable difference between him and them was that he wasn't violent, or at least not that we are aware of. Because let's face it, the more violent the crime is, the better it does for the ratings of the show. Let's call a spade a spade. All I'm saying is there's a possibility he could have still had his dealer's number on speed dial while he was filming the show. That's all I'm saying. And that is very hypocritical if that's the case, because he is a part of the wheel that keeps on turning, if that is the case, allegedly, allegedly. 
could you imagine if the public found out about the propane and seed usage at the time that this show went live? They would have been drug for filth, okay? Absolutely drug for filth. And by no accounts do I excuse what the people did that they ended up airing on the show. Because if you really did commit the crime and you were found guilty, then yes, you do need to go ahead and put that chin up and serve that time that you earned. Now, of course, John and Reve would go on to do great things as a result of the tragedy that they went through. And I would hope that included cleaning up their act. And this is definitely not to paint them in a negative light because their good definitely outweighs their bad. But this just goes to show that everything we see is not always what it may appear to be. So that's all I have to say about that. I'm going to go ahead and let the video do its thing now. Fox eventually would go on to end the series in 2011, but there have been several spinoffs from that show as well. So later, John would go on to host another show called The Hunt with John Walsh on CNN in 2014. And then after that, John and his son Callahan Walsh went on to host another show called In Pursuit with John Walsh on Investigation Discovery. So both shows were very similar to America's Most Wanted, where they would highlight a suspect that was on the run and then urge the public to aid in finding them. Despite all of the horrific events that have happened throughout this case, John and Rube went on to have three more children after the death of their son Adam. They had a daughter, Megan, who was born in 1982, and then they had two sons, Callahan and Hayden, who were born in 1985 and 1994. And despite their troubles, John and Rube ended up staying married. However, they did file for divorce, but eventually had their attorneys withdraw the paperwork, deciding that they would work on their marriage, which is very commendable because a situation like this would definitely break up many families and for good reason. So the fact that they were able to work through this just really goes to show that their faith in each other and love for one another is beyond anything we can even understand. So you guys were probably wondering, well, what happened to Adam's killer? Did he ever get caught? So the reason I really didn't bring it up until now is because unfortunately no one was actually convicted for the disappearance and death of Adam Walsh. However, two names circulated towards this case. Now, one of them was a bit far-fetched but understandable as far as why people would suspect this person and that was actually Jeffrey Dahmer because if you recall, Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes happened in the 70s going into the 80s and this case was around that time as well but later on like around 2007 i want to say it was february 6 2007 john walsh came out and debunked that theory that jeffrey Dahmer had anything to do with his son's disappearance or murder now there was one suspect's name who kept circulating back to the case on many occasions and detectives as well as john believed that he was the person responsible for adam's disappearance and murder and that was a guy by the name of otis tool now I'm not going to get too deep into Otis because he's not the focus of the story, it is about Adam and John, but just to give you a brief synopsis, he was problematic from jump, like he's always been an issue. And so from what I was able to research, he was serving a life sentence for other crimes that he had already committed and they actually believed he was the suspect because they found two articles of clothing in his home which was a pair of green shorts and a shoe if i'm not mistaken that matched what adam was wearing on the day that he disappeared now for whatever reason the evidence disappeared got lost went missing no one knows what happened to it and so for those reasons when Otis had eventually admitted to the crimes, he recanted. And then at some point, he had admitted again that he did it and recanted once again. This is a police report that I had come across regarding the confessions of Otis Tool, And that was a confession versus medical findings form. And unfortunately, it is very pixelated, as you guys can see. 
not sure why it's showing like that because it was crystal clear when I came across it. But I'll briefly go over some of the details that I read with you from the report. But if you want to read all of the details, because they are pretty gruesome and horrific, then you can just look it up again. It's the Otis Tool Confession versus Medical Findings. I'll put the name on the screen to give you the exact name. But some of the details included how he decapitated the head, what instrument he used, the amount of force he put basically applied in order to complete the task so on and so forth and then the medical examiner basically corroborated everything that was said with his findings as well or her i don't know if it was a male or female but i assume it was a male now unfortunately because of that there was no official conviction and otis would later die in prison so on december 16th of 2008 they officially closed Adam Walsh's case and deemed Otis Tool to be the prime suspect of his crime. Even though they didn't have the proof anymore, at one point they did, but it's kind of like one of those things like, we knew you did it, we just didn't have the evidence to support it anymore, but we know you're the one who did it. And since the closing of that case, there haven't been any new leads or any other tips that have come in. So. Everyone pretty much has just been content with the fact that Otis Toole was deemed the person responsible for Adam Walsh's murder. And then there were also reports that people were saying things like, oh my gosh, they're having more children to replace Adam. You know, people just being weird and saying weird mean things. But that could be further from the truth, to be honest. And one thing that Reve had mentioned was after the birth of Megan, it actually made her miss Adam even more because one of the things that he said he always wanted was a little sister. Yeah, I know. That's pretty sad, right? So, that concludes my, my video on John Walsh and Adam Walsh. So let me know down in the comments, did you already know that story and what are your takes on it? Another fact that I did read about is that now a lot of department stores have, um, they have a system called Code Adam. So if you've never worked in a department store before or you've never heard of this, Code Adam basically means if a parent discovers that their child is missing or they can't find them for whatever reason they will announce code Adam in which every single employee well not every single employee but every single exit is covered by an employee so no one can enter or leave the store until that child is found and this was implemented after obviously the death of Adam Walsh and if I remember correctly I believe Walmart was one of the first retail um, was one of the first retailers to implement this new system to prevent cases like Adam Walsh's from reoccurring and I think that was an awesome idea it's just so interesting to see how much John Walsh has accomplished from such a major tragedy this type of situation could have broken someone down to the core and instead of you know divorcing his wife and you know drowning in misery he went on to open up a show and help other families not even in the same situation, but just any type of situation and solve so many cases. And he just basically changed the way that law enforcement handles cases like this. And I think that's so commendable. So I'm gonna finish my makeup off camera real quick and then come back with the finished look and then give y'all an update for the next crime case that I will be talking about. So guys, that basically sums up today's case. Now, as far as what you can expect from me in the future videos, I do have Halloween cases that I will be covering during the last week of this month, obviously because it's Halloween. And then uh, moving forward, I have that one case that I told you fell in my lap. 
and I'll be talking more about that one and yeah so also if y'all have any case requests that you would like me to cover you can drop them down in the comment section or you can send them to me via DM on Instagram and that is spelled exactly like my YouTube channel name and yeah so this is the final book and I really hope you guys like it um, all of the products again will be listed down below in the description box so just check there if you don't see them within the first 24 hours they will definitely be there within 48 and that will be it for today's video so I hope you appreciate the case that I was able to share with y'all today and I will see you in the next true crime case